Live from our seven Tasmania studios, your nightly news with Kim Miller begins now. Good evening everyone. First tonight, the Commission of Inquiry into Child Sexual Abuse has finished its hearings into the Ashley Youth Detention Centre, with the department head today publicly apologising for the pain and suffering those abused faced. Commission lawyers also taking the culture of the centre to task, claiming the centre is continuing to harm children. An apology decades in the making to those failed by Ashley. And as Secretary of the Department, I sincerely apologise to each and every young person that Tasmanian government departments did not provide safe and secure care for at Ashley. Giving evidence today, Michael Purvin acknowledged sexual abuse was rife at the centre. It's open to the Commission to find that um, there has been ongoing sexual abuse of some detainees by some officials at Ashley over the last 20 years. Yes, I would with the impact likely to be a lifetime burden. I also acknowledge that your pain will be lifelong, that the abuse impacts who you are, who you wanted to be, and how you feel about yourselves and others. Also admitting some staff continued working, even after claims against them had been recognised by the National Redress Scheme. Commissioners told while legal advice prevented them from using it to stand people down, more could have been done. Regardless of that advice that we couldn't pursue those matters, uh, we should have come up with some way of keeping track of that information. I could... Due to be replaced by two new modern facilities in 2024, that timeline today was described as ambitious. If doing it right means that we won't meet that timeline on the, the knocker, um, that's something that we'll take to government as early as we can. Commission lawyers using their closing address to blast the centre's culture. It's clear that Ashley has harmed and continues to risk harming children. Laying the blame squarely at the feet of the state. You may also consider a finding that the state was aware of these allegations of abuse a number of years ago and did not, as a state, take sufficient action to satisfy itself that children at Ashley was safe from the risk of child sexual abuse. Hearings will resume again next month. The impact of the past seven days acknowledged by the Commission's president. This has been a very difficult um, period in our hearings, I think. Many hoping the pain of today leads to a better tomorrow. The moment a young person comes into custody, we should be thinking about and planning for their ultimate release. John Hunt, 7 Tasmania News. Notorious rapist and murderer Jamie John Curtis is back behind bars in Tasmania tonight. Our reporter Brianna Boylan is live in the studio and Brianna, it's believed Curtis breached parole. Kim, just before nine yesterday morning, 66-year-old Jamie John Curtis was arrested in South Hobart, but authorities remain tight-lipped on the nature of his parole breach. It comes only a month after Curtis successfully apply, applied to have his monitoring anklet removed, and it's not the first time he's broken parole, the convicted killer signing up to dating sites under a fake name in 2018. We spoke to his victim, Tamika Ridgway, a little earlier, who says she found out the news through media reports. He's changed my life completely, and not only my life, but the life of Dean's family. It's just, yeah, hard to put into words, but it's damage that can never, ever be repaired. Kim Tamika is now working with other survivors to see rape and murder considered one crime as opposed to an aggravating factor. OK, thank you very much, Brianna. Well, nearly three months on from being tasked with one of the most prominent portfolios in the nation, that of housing, Julie Collins admits the solutions are not easy. The Tasmanian laying out her ambitious plans to tackle the worsening crisis with a disadvantaged upbringing of her own, making the goal personal. 2007, delivering her maiden speech in Parliament. Early days on the campaign trail, now leading to a vital position in the Coalition's Cabinet. It's absolutely a huge challenge and I, I, I don't underestimate how difficult a task it is. In the grips of crisis, the responsibility of the housing and homelessness portfolio is clear. We've got ordinary working families, um, often on two incomes, coming in and saying, you know, we're at the end of our lease or, you know, we have to move and we can't find anywhere to, to live. I've not seen that before in my time in politics as I have seen in the last 12 months. 
with her own state facing some of the toughest conditions in the country. What do you think some of the biggest challenges are, and I know there's not just one, but facing the housing industry right now? The solutions are not easy, uh, but they require thoughtful, evidence-based uh, policies. It's the developers, it's the social housing providers, the homelessness services, and it's about all of us working together as a team. A big year ahead to deliver on promises. So I want to get up and running the election commitment around the regional first home buyers support scheme, the government equity scheme in terms of the help to buy scheme. Housing builds are declining despite a desperate need for more homes. It's these sorts of issues that will be tackled through the establishment of a new national housing supply and affordability council. And work with uh, a new entity we're going to create called Housing Australia uh, that will implement a national housing and homelessness plan that we also want to work on. So it's a very ambitious agenda. With a long stint in the political realm, there's been plenty of initial hurdles to overcome. Door knocking and being asked, you know, with three young children, um, you know, how could I spend so much time in Canberra and be a federal politician? And I said, I'll do it the same way as a man would do it who has children. But the hard work is far from over. Grace Evans, 7 Tasmanian News. Dogs were front and centre on the third day of Agfest, with crowds out in force for another day under clear and sunny skies. Politicians from both sides of politics pausing to get among the action. Who let the dogs out? The Quirkus Park United Kennel Club showing off the skills of pups in both rally obedience and duck herding at Agfest. We're just here promoting performance sports for dogs. The exercises help strengthen the bond between owner and dog, which trainers say allow for maximum enjoyment with your pets. If you've got a, a dog that doesn't want to play with you or something, it's really hard to have, you know, have some fun with it. A bask of sunshine allowing for another bumper crowd. Thousands exploring all things agriculture while not getting too bogged down with the exhibitions. The Primary Industries Minister also making a stop this morning, announcing an updated joint venture biosecurity operation plan, with diseases like foot and mouth knocking on our doorstep. And biosecurity has always been very much front and centre of what we need to do here in Tasmania. And we really need to work hard to keep our eye on the ball and ensure that these don't get in and to work rapidly if they ever do. Labor out supporting farmers concerned about land acquisitions for mariners' transmission lines, calling for ongoing compensation for use of their land. These farmers in the north northwest need our agricultural minister to stand up with them to ensure that they are properly compensated. There's, there's added uh, issues to our operation that, uh, that arise from having those things there. Mark Zita, 7 Tasmania News. Deloraine's long abandoned race course will soon be revolutionised when it converts into a community space. A new football oval, park run course and camping site are all part of the vision. But its centrepiece will honour the town's rich racing history, delighting those with long connections to the course. Memories of the Deloraine steeplechase echo through the old brush jumps. Southerly Drift is coming at him, but Angus Ayres is holding on near the line and Angus Ayres won the National. A great ride, a great training effort. The crowd absolutely loved the steeple chasing, the, the spills and the thrills. Tony Wadley was a regular racegoer here for 50 years. He even saw his father win a Grand National back in the 60s. Deloraine played a big part in putting Tasmanian racing on the map. Now, Deloraine Racing will be put on the map when a new precinct honours its past. Go and get the horses and lead them over, you know, you, you, you felt good. Lifelong horseman Brian Rolls, brother of legendary trainer the late Terry Rolls, backs the plan. Well, I think something's got to be done, you know, because it's, it's beautiful land being wasted. The vision includes a recreational lake, footpaths for park run, camping space and a second oval for Deloraine's growing football club. It can get pretty wet down here and by keeping uh, participants off the main ground and using the second ground, yeah, it, it uh, makes a lot of sense to do that. The development is a showpiece for the town and funding reflects that. Around $20 million will be spent on the site over 10 years. Now it's over to the public. The council is welcoming ideas and feedback until the end of September. And we want to reinvigorate this area and turn it into the green spine of Deloraine. Jump-starting a revival of the grand old racetrack. Tom Johnson, 7 Tasmania News.
Launceston councillor Jim Cox has announced his retirement from public life, calling time on his three-decade political career. The former news and radio presenter moved to politics in 1999, uh, 1989 sorry, as a Labor member of Bass, holding various portfolios. Media magnate Edmund Rouse attempted to bribe Cox to cross the floor of Parliament. He later served as the chair of the Road Safety Advisory Council and was elected as a Launceston councillor in 2011. He will finish at the end of the month. His seat will remain vacant until local government elections in October. Tasmanians needing vital stroke treatment can breathe a sigh of relief. A new interventional service at the Royal Hobart Hospital now providing 24-7 medical procedures. Struck down with stroke last month, Paul Calvert's life fell into the hands of another. Thanks to Dr Martin Banez over there, I'm, still, I'm standing here alive today. Losing brain tissue almost every second time was of the essence. I was assessed and operated on very quickly. I think about lunchtime, and I'll see you at 10 o'clock in the morning. Doctors using state-of-the-art technology to restore blood flow to his brain. And we either use a small device to trap the clot and pull it out, or we suction the clot out. It's kind of like corking a bottle. And prevent his condition from worsening. Stroke can be a very disabling condition at the very least. And it can also be a fatal condition in very serious cases. Paul's procedure, part of a new service employing a full-time team of specialists to deliver 24-7 treatment options. An interstate interventional radiologist also helping out wherever possible. Offering advice by reviewing the cases they're doing and sometimes providing real-time online um, visual and audio um, assistance. Prior to this program, the hospital's stroke services were described as patchy, with locum specialists visiting the state every so often. It was really the luck of the draw whether a specialist was here to provide that service. Many patients forced to fly interstate for treatment. Not infrequently by the time they reached Melbourne, um, it was too late and we say um, time lost is brain lost. Already saving 120 lives, the team says it's unacceptable it's taken this long for constant stroke treatments to emerge. Brianna Boylan, 7 Tasmania News. The old Meander Primary School is about to be transformed. Known as Meander House, the site will become a hub for services and support to those vulnerable in the community. The new lease runs until 2027. The Meander House will be for those uh, underprivileged people in the community and those that need a helping hand. The site had previously stirred angst amongst some locals when faith-based group Teen Challenge sought to convert the old school into a rehabilitation centre for women. Meander House will be run by the Community House Network. Interstaters will be the focus of a new marketing campaign to encourage them to visit Tasmania. It will position the state as an ideal location for a road trip. Federal Tourism Minister Don Farrell says Tasmania has much to offer as a quality travel destination. The campaign, supported by a $1.2 million Austrade grant, includes paid media, digital marketing and special offers. It will launch next Monday. A Tasmanian insurer has shone on the national stage once again, taking home a prestigious award, the RACT winning Insurance Company of the Year at the Australia and New Zealand Insurance Industry Awards last night. Nominated the small to medium sized company, it's the third time in five years they've claimed top gong. Good evening. A young New Zealand talent has been picked to fill the Jack Jumper's third and final development player spot. Walter Brown was among hundreds who trialled for the sought-after positions. With a competitive edge, the athletic wing is a welcome addition to the stacked lineup. He's a very tough kid, grit and grind kind of guy. Um, no nonsense. He's very professional at his age already. Um, quite competitive, um, and just all the things that I love about uh, the group that we have here. The boys get after it, which is great. You know, it's a good learning curve playing against guys who are you know bigger, faster, stronger. But uh, it's been enjoyable so far. The NBL side is set to hit the road north next week for its pre-season camp, culminating in two practice matches in Olveston and Launceston against the South East Melbourne Phoenix. Fresh from a week off, the SFL's minor premier won't be taking its opponent lightly in this week's semi-final. Lindisfarne will host Huonville after the third-place Lions stun Signet in last week's qualifying final. The two Blues wary of the quality they'll be up against, also putting their unbeaten streak at the back of their minds.
we wanted this home game to get into granny and we got it. That's all that matters to us now, so that's what we're going to focus on. Um, yeah, as I said, we, we really respect Huonville. They're well oiled, back line, midfield, forward line, especially their forward line, so looking to stop their opportunities up forward and create more for us. The first bounce at Anzac Park is at 2pm tomorrow. South Hobart has tucked away another win in the Women's Super League, knocking the Kingborough Lions off their feet with a 5-2 victory. Taking on Devonport this weekend, the side says it's looking forward to a competitive match after a string of one-sided games. We're taking it as probably our most important game of the season, just so we can keep our position at top of the ladder and hoping Lonnie drops some points. Meanwhile, Riverside has newfound confidence after turning its luck around in the NPL. They'll be going head-to-head -head with Clarence, which in sixth place on the ladder admits it's not where it wants to be. This is certainly one that we, we want to pencil in as, as something we desperately need a result from. We're trying to do the right thing in terms of, of playing out of the back, in terms of being courageous enough as well to receive the ball in, uh, under pressure or trying to get out of, of tight spaces on the field. Clarence says its focus now lies in setting up the side for a good season next year. And our Friday flashback is heading back to 2016 when the Kangaroos played Richmond on a Friday night in Hobart. Now if for any reason you're planning to catch a replay of this game somehow and don't wish to know the final score, look away now. North Melbourne extended its contract to play in Hobart in 2016. There's not one thing about playing football in this part of the world that hasn't been absolutely superb for our club. And the deal brought plenty of fireworks. How good is this? Live music. Stay light, cheerful, the crowd's on your side. And history. Friday night football in Hobart. For the first and only time. Daniel Wells kicked the first goal of the game, Jack Rewalt the first for Richmond. But this was a night fellow Tasmanian Ben Brown would savour. Richo, help us out. Is it, is it Benny Brown's uh, twin? Oh, it has to be, doesn't it? The game was the big freeze as fans covered up in chilly conditions. Even the cameramen looked like bank robbers trying to stay warm. Could have organised a bit of warmer weather down here tonight, Will. But... After the main break, Ty Vickery was running hot sending home a barrel from 50, but the Kangaroos smashed Richmond to the tune of 70 points. They started fast and they finished strongly and they make it eight in a row on this historic night in Hobart at Blunston. North wind big against the Tigers. A Friday night footy in Tassie was a hit. A night to remember for nearly 18,000 fans. Good evening. Well, today seemed like a bit of a practice for next week's spring. Hobart 15 degrees, Launceston 16, Burnie 12 and Devonport 13 degrees. 18 was the maximum at Bushy Park and Campania. Some temperatures up to 8 degrees above average. Grove 17, St Helens and Friendly Beaches 16, Smithton 15, Lyawini and Flinders Island reached 14 degrees, King Island and Strawn 13 and Lowhead 12. Mostly sunny today with just some cloud over the west and north coast. Plenty brewing there through Bass Strait. Low level cloud worked over the southeast of the nation along with coastal parts of North Queensland. Tomorrow, the high sits over eastern Victoria and Tasmania and sends ridges over most of the country. There is a coastal trough over central parts of Western Australia. Variable winds will tend north to northeastly during the morning at 10 to 20 knots and to 25 knots over the west coast. The weekend opens up like this. Cloud easing from Hobart, a top of 15, 14 for Maydina and Oatlands, fine with just a little bit of cloud. Launceston, a shower or two, 15 the top, 13 for Devonport, shower as well, shower for Lyawini, one overnight, nine the high. 13 for Burnie with a shower, cloudy for Strawn, 15 and Marrowar, 13 degrees. And along the east coast, partly cloudy. 15 for St Helens and Orford, 16 the top for Swansea. On Sunday, a few scattered showers over the north, extending to the east and west for a period. Showers creeping up slowly on Monday before extending statewide, maybe a thunderstorm over the west. And on Tuesday, scattered showers once again across the state. Showers in Perth, partly cloudy weather over Adelaide, fine in Melbourne after morning fog. Showers on the way for Sydney, 19 the top. Brisbane and Cairns also expecting wet weather. Partly cloudy in Hobart, 10 right now, 10 in Launceston and clear, a bit of cloud over Devonport and also 10 degrees. And Kim, I made the big trick out to Agfest today, great event, but you really need to plan your visit. Negotiate the car park paddock, see what you want to see and eat and drink just enough to not have to go to the toilet.
Good advice. Thank you, Merv. Have a great weekend. Well, before we go tonight, Tasmanian devils aren't known for their cuddles, but one resident at Wings Wildlife Park is proving otherwise. When senior wildlife keeper Nicole entered Juno's pen after two weeks' leave, she received a very warm welcome from the 18-month-old. The park says it's unusual for Tasmanian devils of Juno's age to still be interested in their carers, but this pair obviously share a special bond. Gorgeous, what a way to end this week. And that is all we have time for this evening. Thanks for joining us this week. Lou will be with you over the weekend. For now, it's good night.